Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the special meeting of the City of White Plains Planning Board. Uh, the single agenda item for this meeting is the draft version of the comprehensive plan. Uh, so let me introduce everybody that's involved. First, the board members were all present this evening. My name is John Ioris. To my right, Liz Merriman, Vanelli Yahadi, Serena Russell. To my left, Lynn Oliva, Anna Cabrera, and Lauren Morris. We have Arthur Goodekunst, our legal counsel. We have present Chris Gomez, the Commissioner of Planning. We have uh, Deputy Commissioner Mezzi and, uh, of Planning and our Board Secretary Eileen McLean. Uh, and just to divulge to everyone that's here or everybody listening at home, uh, m both myself and Vanella Yahani were involved in the production of this draft comprehensive plan that we're going to be evaluating this evening. Uh, so we're obviously well familiar with it, and I need to get some more familiarity for what the other members think about it tonight, because we have not ever discussed this at a meeting. Commissioner Gomez. Thank you, Chairman Iores. Um, yes, yeah, so as the Chairman said, uh, both Vanella and uh, Chairman Iores were both part of the Conference of Plan Committee, which was a 15-member uh, appointed committee by the Mayor to spend the better part of a year uh, working with city staff, myself and the planning department, uh, and some consultants and drafting the draft of the One White Plains Conference of Plan. So again, this has been a labor of probably over two and a half years um, of public outreach. And I'm just going to have a brief intro video here that explains the comprehensive planning process, kind of in a nice two minute kind of segment. And then I get into a PowerPoint that explains kind of, you know, kind of next steps and where we are. Uh, and I'm also going to use the opportunity tonight to clarify a few things. I know there's certainly been some concern, I would say, in the community about certain initiatives that are being proposed. And I just wanted to kind of clarify what those are. Um, and then we can have a discussion, obviously, both about anything in the plan. Um, and we can also uh, talk about specific initiatives that are uh, kind of tagging, if you will, the planning board uh, to be a lead in the future going forward. So let me start with this video, and I'll be back in a moment. Welcome to the One White Plains Comprehensive Plan, a dynamic, forward-thinking, groundbreaking document that represents the culmination of a two-and-a-half-year public planning process. The plan provides policy direction for the future growth of the city, and it's not just about bricks-and-mortar development. It's about infrastructure, it's about social capital, it's about maintaining and enhancing the wonderful city that we have. Our plan starts with a vision. The One White Plains vision statement was derived from over 2,000 public comments elicited from every corner of the community. The planning process was shepherded by a 15-member volunteer conference of plan committee appointed by the mayor to represent the broader White Plains community. The committee worked closely with the planning department and consultants to prepare the draft One White Plains plan for Common Council adoption. The One White Plains public outreach strategy was guided by two essential objectives. One, to make grassroots stakeholder participation and input central to the conference of planning process and two, to ensure that underrepresented populations felt welcome to participate so that everyone's voices are reflected in the future vision for White Plains. With those objectives in mind, the city created a myriad of both traditional and innovative public input opportunities to maximize citizen participation, including mobile listening tours, interactive public workshops, stakeholder meetings and focus groups, social pinpoint mapping, online surveys, and the use of social media. Significant input came from all corners of White Plains in various languages, from people of all ages and differing points of view. In reviewing thousands of public comments, three overarching themes clearly emerged. Equity and inclusion, environmental sustainability, enhancement of the public realm. All the ingredients were combined and analyzed. The result? a One White Plains plan that is organized into six discrete elements. Connect, green, live, play, strengthen, and work. Within each element, you'll find existing conditions analysis, topical themes, and recommended initiatives. The draft plan is now complete, but our work isn't done. The implementation section provides a general roadmap for the city to begin the implementation process and prioritize initiatives based on available resources. Want to learn more? 
The plan can be found on the One White Plains website, onewhiteplains.com slash elements. Hard copies are available at the city clerk's office, the library, and the planning department. 30 months, thousands of public comments, dozens of community events, hundreds of volunteer hours, three themes, six elements, 145 initiatives. One dynamic plan, one great city, one White Plains. All right, so as I pull up the PowerPoint, I'll try to match the excitement of the narrator there. Very passionate, you could tell. Well done, right? And thanks also to the cable, um, Rita Santos, who's behind our mystery door behind that, helped us put that together. Again, we're out on the road just to illustrate kind of the work that went into the drafting of the plan. So here we are this evening after a long two and a half year road um, giving a presentation. Again, the Common Council has already uh, heard or had their first public hearing on the document. It was adjourned to March 4th. So right from the get-go, I want to say, anybody that's interested, come out March 4th in these chambers, 7.30, uh, Monday night, and uh, the continuation of the public hearing, your opportunity to speak. So um, I start with this slide, and I can, you guys have all seen this, but it's important for me to start uh, from the beginning. What is the plan, and what is an official conference of plan? And really, it's a policy document. You know, it's really providing future growth guidance about development, infrastructure, services. I always say it's not just about bricks and mortar. It's about social capital. It's about economics, demographics, et cetera. And more than that, it's these four things, right? It's aspirational, educational, concise, and dynamic. I did promise the council from this lectern two and a half years ago that since we are White Plains, right, our, our plan would be becoming or befitting of a community of, such as ours, that we'd meet these goals. And I believe the draft is, is there. So we're really pleased with the progress. Why are we doing this? It's really to codify the vision of a community, um, getting into the notion of shaping versus protecting the future and really recognizing from the get-go that change is inevitable, and we can either plan for it or not, but to just protect and you know, preserve the city in Ember, as I say, is impossible, um, and we want to be on top of that. So what does the community want to be, and then who is the community anyway? I mean, it's not just, obviously, the wonderful residents that call White Plains home. It's the people that work here, shop here, dine here, um, you know, recreate here, et cetera. So it's, we've heard from all of those people, or we've tried. <laughs> Um, we acknowledge that change is inevitable and that also we cannot plan in a vacuum. So we did incorporate both regional planning policy from Westchester County, uh, even the five boroughs of New York City in terms of looking at synergies, but we also look at our neighbors, Greenberg, Scarsdale, Harrison, North Castle, et cetera, um, recognizing that we're 10 square miles and we're mighty in White Plains, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that a lot of these land use issues cross borders, infrastructure, et cetera. And then I always have to hit the equity in planning in that these documents have an extensive legacy. So not only the city that we live in here, but every community in America has been shaped by these planning documents uh, dating back to the 19 teens and 20s. So a lot of what we see where it relates to where housing, where housing, where housing is, you know, single family versus multifamily versus um, job access, et cetera, affordability, it's all tied back to these vision statements and plans which inform a local zoning code. So I want to say it right now, and I'll get to it later. This document is not changing the zoning of the city of White Plains. There's a lot of recommendations that kind of nibble at edges of areas we want to improve the zoning code, in our opinion, uh, and in the community's opinion, frankly, with what we heard. But this itself, this document, uh, once adopted by the Common Council, does not have any associated zoning changes uh, to what is actually permitted to be built in any area of the city. We have a long history of this. This isn't the first time. It's not our first rodeo, so to speak. Um, we did it way back in 1928. That was our very first one. We had a big plan in 62, 77. Our current plan that's on the books is 1997 with a big, big update in 2006. So even that update to the present day, a lot has changed. So we obviously went back to the well two and a half years ago, looked at what was kind of, what the bones were in that plan, so to speak, what was still working, and then how we could incorporate sort of modern, uh, you know, policy, et cetera, to the current One White Plains draft. Importantly, the planning department does planning all the time. So the conference of plan, yes, is a very large plan that incorporates kind of analysis of the whole city. But this is something Judy Mezzi and the planning department leads up our community development, uh, which is a program that mostly is funded through the community development block grant 
federal funds from HUD. So we do annual action planning on five-year increments. We also uh, did a really extensive public outreach around the White Plains strategic uh, transit district, I should say, strategic plan, which looked at the area around the train station. And that was well attended. That was uh, about four years ago. So that's a huge plan you can see, which has informed part of the comprehensive plan. And then here we are today with the draft updated plan. So what's in a name? One White Plains. Um, and I've had the fortune, I've been with the city as commissioner for eight and a half years now. And I've been to most of the neighborhoods that are active. Every neighborhood has an active neighborhood association. And clearly the strength of the city, we all recognize, is those strong neighborhoods, right? And so in taking those neighborhoods and my, uh, you know, going out on the road the last few years for sure, recognizing that a lot of people have concerns about the city or ways to improve their neighborhood. Um, and a lot of them love their neighborhoods, right? And so there's a lot of synergy between whether you're in the south end of the city, downtown, north part of the city, in terms of all the things people tell me. So 28 neighborhoods, how do we leverage that to one city and start thinking a little bit more holistically about some of these issues? Um, because we know clearly out of many, one e pluribus unum, we're stronger together, and that's the great seal of this great country. So the thought was, how do we break down those barriers, still recognizing the essence of each neighborhood, but you know, have these uh, public outreach sessions where people and neighbors could meet each other and understand their similarities. So we came up with a vision after 2,000 comments. Um, we are One White Plains, a welcoming, safe, inclusive community with housing, employment, education, transportation, and recreational opportunities that fulfill the needs of our diverse population. A city where business, culture, and the arts thrive, where the natural environment is valued, and where public spaces are accessible. We acknowledge our history and address regional, social, and economic trends to plan for an equitable and sustainable future. So what I'll say about this statement is it wasn't uh, cooked up in a lab. It wasn't something that I wrote. It was something that we put forth uh, about two years ago and got extensive public comment on. And I love the way it reads. I love that it incorporates sort of all of our uh, you know, the wonderful desires and dreams we have for the One White Plains plan. This is the lens through which every initiative and every statement in the plan was kind of measured against, right? This is what we're aspiring to. The plan is aspirational after all. So this is the vision statement and the vision for One White Plains. So as I said, the mayor and the, and the mayors appointed with the council 15 members to serve on a comprehensive planning committee, which is required by state law if, if the actual um, executive or legislative body, such as the, the uh, Common Council, were not going to run this process. They would delegate a comprehensive plan committee, and that's what they did in this case. Fifteen members, I want to acknowledge their names. I put the two planning board members in orange here, both John and Vanilla. Um, and what they did, the comprehensive plan committee, was serve for over a year. They had over ten meetings. All the meetings are available on the OneWhitePlains.com website. They were publicly accessible, attended, noticed, etc. Um, and what they did is they discussed a lot of the issues from background demographics to sort of the organization of the plan. They steered, reviewed, and also commented on the plan content that was generated both by city staff uh, and consultants. And then what we did during this process, which I thought was kind of innovative, is we gave ownership uh, to the committee uh, for each of the chapters or elements. So as you saw, there are six elements of the plan, um, and each of those kind of got chapter champions, so to speak, which was... Uh, folks that would lead discussions at each of these meetings, and you'll see that online, and took a kind of a greater interest and deep dive in each of those. They also represented the committee at public events and workshops, basically representing the city. And then most importantly, the draft that you see before you was, you know, their draft, the Conference of Plan Committee draft. They held a public hearing on the draft, and that was the draft that was forwarded to the Common Council for their consideration. So, again, public comment, Conference of Plan Committee, city staff, and consultants have put this plan together for Common Council uh, consideration. The journey itself, uh, it's more than 30 months now, but we kicked it off in 2021 uh, in the midst of some COVID. You know, you can see some of those public meetings we held at the Jaguar Room, uh, wonderfully attended. We had three really major meetings I'll get into in a moment. But what I thought was really innovative was the approach to get out into the community and just listen from a very, very early, this is, we don't have to go through this, but from an early, early, early uh, outreach initiatives, we went out and did a listening tour. So we went out on over 12 different days. We did Zoom, uh, where we just listened to folks. No preconceived ideas. What do you want to see? What's your vision for the future of White Plains? And so we also did a vision survey. Uh, tell us the three words, your future vision for White Plains. And this is a word cloud on the bottom left representing uh, the most salient words we heard from affordable to diverse to green. 
Um, what do you want to see? When White Plains grows up, what do you want to see? Um, and so that was the way we started the process. We also held a large workshop uh, back in 2021. Many of you were there, but these are the sort of comments we saw. We kind of initiated our elements. We also did a web-based forum where we got a lot of comments. So these are obviously a lot of the same and kind of the most common things we saw. A lot about affordability, a lot about sidewalk, pedestrian connectivity, and then really prioritizing green space in the core of downtown. We had a follow-up workshop nearly a year later after we drafted a lot of content, but also established these six elements. And what we did there is we rolled up our sleeves, I like to say, and we literally had these round tables with subject matter experts in sustainability and transportation, uh, in land use and zoning. And we had well, at, you know, over 75 people there that were really engaged. Uh, all the meeting videos, information can be found online. And we also launched at that meeting our interactive web-based map, which is kind of still available actually on the onewhiteplains.com website, where people were able to kind of not just comment and, and locate their comments specific, geographic specific, but actually have conversations. So sort of like a social media approach where people could kind of tag each other's comments and kind of agree and have a discussion. So we certainly got a lot of very specific info from that. We had a large workshop in June of 2023 at the Public Library, and this one was probably my favorite, and people got really excited because when they entered, we gave them different color stickers, very playful, and we even gave gold stars for the initiatives they were going to comment on or to at least identify. We unveiled the 145 initiatives at that time before the six elements, and people were kind of just voting, so to speak, and voting with their feet and voting with their stickers, and that was a way for us to really get people engaged to talk about these issues uh, those 145 initiatives in a very uh, you know, dynamic setting, we thought. We had over 150 participants, which was awesome. We followed it up with a Spanish language workshop. So this was in October of 2023. We also did a similar outreach thing all in Spanish where we had a presentation from Yaskara Maldonado from the planning department. Uh, Freddie and, and Cassandra and Judy all helped out. And this was hosted at El Centro Hispano. And we got wonderful feedback there as well. So the plan itself, yes, it's a hard copy plan. It's a hard copy document. You can download it, 400 pages plus at your leisure. Feel free. Or you can use the online version. And that's what we tried to do is make it dynamic and uh, you know, not connect dust, uh, collect dust on the shelf, so to speak. The plan itself has an introduction, clearly. It has these six core elements, which you see here, connect, green, live, play, strengthen, and work. Each of those six elements have a very clear introduction, identification of topics and objectives within each element, an analysis of existing conditions, which are very deep, um, and then they conclude with recommendations or initiatives within each element. Those are numbered, right? So there's a green, white, plains, one initiative, a two, a three, et cetera. And there's also appendices within each element, which is important because as you look at the document online, we thought it very important to have all the sustainability environmental appendix, which is very robust, with the Green White Plains element, um, and not just in a large appendix with every section uh, and analysis and baseline data. So you can go read each of the elements uh, you know, by itself as a discrete element. You can read it in order. You can download it. So the idea was to make it dynamic that way. Importantly, there's no hierarchy of the elements. That's why we use the circle. Um, they're all important, and they all overlap, and there's synergies between all of them. So the thought was we would not just, you know, if you print it out, Connect happens to be the first one, but that doesn't mean we look at transportation any more importantly than the environment or, or uh, recreation. There is an implement WP, which is the implementation section, which talks about who's going to be taking these initiatives, what the time frames are, and then there's the supplemental reports, which are important, and those are demographics and land use. Those are actually separate. And there's a very in-depth, probably the most in-depth analysis of demographics on how the city's changed, and a nice analysis of sort of the retail and office market in downtown White Plains. We had an independent consultant, Street Sense, work on that. And I should also mention, in addition to our main consultants, BFJ Planning, that helped us with this effort, we also had an expert, subject matter expert in the environmental field, uh, Ramble, internationally known as it relates to sustainable initiatives and green infrastructure. So we definitely had experts at the table in addition to the city staff and the public. Um, so implementation, there's these matrices. So each element has, as I said, a number of initiatives. And what's important is if you go online, it doesn't really matter how you view them, right? Because everything's dynamic, you can click between them. 
But if you look, each, for example, the Green White Plain Initiative 1, Green White Plains 1, is to create an open space and natural resource inventory. Not only does it kind of give kind of the implementation kind of leads, in one case here it's the Planning Department, Recreation and Parks Department, Conservation Board, but if you look in that kind of rectangle, it also references the other elements or the other initiatives and other elements, in this case Play White Plains 1, that has a similar sort of uh, connection. So this is all about updating the Recreation and Parks Master Plan. So synergies between initiatives, so we recognize they're in different elements, but there's actually a cross sort of pollination, if you will, between these 147 initiatives we added to since the public hearing in front of the Conference of Plan Committee. We also have a land use approach summary. So this is just a graphic representation on the map of many of the 147 initiatives. In very general terms, this is a perfect example of while we talk about the need to study certain future zoning changes, for example, along Westchester Avenue, it's very clear that we're not being parcel specific here. We're talking about corridors, we're talking about areas of the city, we're talking about large open spaces. So we're very cognizant in putting the plan together that we recognize that in every case, any specific zoning change that's recommended here will have to undergo further study, environmental review under the State Environment Equality Review Act, and public hearings in front of the Common Council as a legislative body. So I want to make that clear that there's a lot of things here pointing to sort of general um, and somewhat specific recommendations uh, to infrastructure. And we do have time frame, short term to long term to ongoing. Um, I'll also say because I've worked on a few of these plans, because we're White Plains and we're so wonderful, and we do a lot of these things already, you'll see ongoing a few times in terms of maintaining our city's infrastructure, being you know, having a critical eye to how we can enhance stormwater facilities like we're already uh, committing city resources to do. So um, you'll see some of that. Continue on the path we've been, enhance where available, and then we have some really bold statements. Um, I do want to show you, before I conclude here, not only can you download each of these elements and the plan or view them online as a document, a PDF, you can also, I'm going to give the planning department, I'm never shy about talking how great the planning department is. Um, Christy Necht in our office has been able to in-house put these into what we call story maps. So if you go to the website, onewayplains.com, right now, you can view a story map of each of the elements and the introduction and all the public outreach and all the demographics in a much more user-friendly kind of way where you can kind of zoom down and see a dynamic interaction, a story of what Live White Plains is. So if you don't want to read the 80 pages of Live White Plains in its entirety, you get kind of the highlights, you get all the recommendations, you get a lot of really cool interactive features that talk about everything from the zoning, commercial districts. It was built on a mapping platform, which I'm very proud of in our office, so the idea is these are interactive maps where you can kind of zoom in, you can get information on land use and zoning, you can learn about the city's affordable housing program. I get, we get questions, you know, hundreds of calls a week and contacts, so it's all here. Um, we talk about some of the initiatives as it relates to public housing and different types of uh, land use and zoning issues. Uh, we get into housing trends. We get into things such as um, what are the main strategies for the city moving forward? How do we continue to attract new development? Um, so it goes on and on. I won't go through all of it, but you really get an example here of how we're trying to use the internet and our mapping capabilities um, all done in-house to make this a dynamic plan. Well, this is one of my favorites. I had This had to be. I take a lot of pictures of development as it goes, but this is kind of fun. You can kind of see a lot of before and after shots. Uh, we do it for urban renewal, so there's a lot of just fun things to kind of look at the history of the city. Um, land use and zoning, I won't go through all of it, but it ends with initiatives. So if you click just to the initiatives, you don't have to scroll down. You can see all 27 within LIV as the draft has right now. And importantly, each of the initiatives has a, a clear headline, right, which you'll see in green. You see it in the document. But then within the story maps of the document, each of them also has a lot of text kind of getting into more detail. So, you know, conducting a feasibility study to identify reasonable standards for accessory dwelling units, ADUs, on single family property. So this is getting into, again, a recommendation to study feasibility that if the city were to consider ADU regulations, these are the sorts of things, right, that should be considered. Special permit requirements, lot sizes, parking requirements. So, Again, looking at ways to be progressive in how we can attack this critical housing problem that's national now um, in our own community. And there's many different tools, right? The Comprehensive Plan Committee 
really identified a multitude of tools. The idea being we need all of them. Some will be more successful than others. Some will be more palatable than others. But the idea is that this vision statement lays a clear framework for what we can as a city hope to achieve. Um, see, continue to support. A lot of continue because we do great work already. But housing authority, things like that. Um, appendix, as I noted, you can go right there and see all the background data, which is super exciting on housing. I get a lot of questions about who's going to live in all these apartments downtown and you know, are they all going to go vacant and what's the vacancy rate? All those things are here. We even made them pretty to match the color scheme, which is important to me. Um, and then you can download it. So if you want to download it, or even cooler, you can read it through one of our, you know, almost like you're reading virtually. And there's actually a, a page turn sound. This is my favorite part of the whole document. So there we are. So that's the dyna dynamism of each story map. Um, and just to conclude with a clarification before we get into more deep discussion. Again, I've said it before, these are policy recommendations, not a zoning change. I know I've got, I get a lot of calls and emails saying that the council's gonna change the zoning in these areas. That's not true. The conference plan is talking about a future vision of what the city should be considering. Again, public hearing would be required, seeker as well. There's no initiative, I can't say this clear enough, there's no initiative to permit multifamily housing in single family zoning districts. There is not one. Okay? And I'm going to take responsibility for the confusion here. Senior housing, not in single family zoning districts. Single family zoning districts. Well, Windward School, isn't that a single family zoning district? No multifamily would be permitted, and there's no recommendation. I'll explain why. Okay. Well, Study. I'm just saying, but when I. No, no it's, it's the wording, and I think that's important. Yeah. Two reasons for this, Lynn. Yeah, One, this is good. The yeah, this is totally is. good. No, I get a lot of calls, and I want to make sure. And I think the wording, and I think how we can work through this, study the potential to permit accessory dwelling units. That's one, right? That's not a multifamily unit. That's a possibility in certain lots to consider an accessory dwelling unit on property, not multifamily housing under the city zoning code. Again, a study. The second thing, and I think this is the one that I'm sure will be behind me, and on March 4th they're going to be there for, Permit conservation developments in existing multi-family districts. Conservation developments, I have a few slides to explain what the origin of them are, what they actually are, how many we have in the city, and the fact that they're not multi-family, right? Some of them are attached, but they're all single-family residences. And in no case do they provide additional density or height from the existing zoning district in which they're approved. And you guys know that because you work through that. So I will take responsibility for Live White Plains 13, the fact of the matter is conservation developments are allowed, I'll show you in a moment, in a bunch of areas of the city, a bunch of single family districts. The need, and I added in multifamily districts, the reality is multifamily districts have a lot of potential for housing already. So after writing that and after we drafted this, I said, you know, we should have just said, um, we should have kept it, we shouldn't have added multifamily because that confuses people thinking that multifamily development would be permitted. You can already do multifamily, multifamily districts. So the idea that a conservation development by this recommendation would be permitted in a multifamily district doesn't in any way increase density or housing in multifamily districts. So I think that's a big thing with 13. The other thing I keep hearing, and, and I know, and, and I love, um, who did I hear it from? Um, it must have been John Sheehan, and I talked to him about this at one of the meetings. The former Ridgeway Country Club, which we all know and love, and which will be coming back to you very soon with an environmental impact statement to study the proposed subdivision on that site. There is nothing in this new plan that talks about anything different than the current comprehensive plan. The current comprehensive plan of the city that's on the books has this statement, right? It says, if residential development is proposed for the Ridgeway Golf Course site, encourage the use of special clustering techniques, right? That'll ensure the preservation of significant. So you cannot, under our laws now, you cannot uh, do a conservation development on the former Ridgeway Golf Course or Westchester Hills. Um, but the plan did recognize in 1997 and 2006 that while you can't do conservation developments, perhaps the city should, and we never did, formulize a zoning change or a subdivision regulation change that encourages special clustering techniques, not a conservation subdivision. So everything that's been carried through into this plan talking about future opportunity to cluster has been in the existing plan. So there's definitely not anything that's changed as a result of the One White Plains update. Um, so facts, I took the time because I thought, and staff, we took the time because I wanted to make this very clear, what a conservation subdivision is and what it isn't, what the myths are, 
and I want to allay people's fears about even specific sites in the city. Um, so here we are. It's not new. It's been in the zoning code since 1980, which means it predates not only the 2006, but the 1997 plan that's on the books. So it was established. We, we tracked down the legislation. They all contain single family homes. So a conservation subdivision is not multifamily. There is an opportunity if you have 10 or more acres under the current regulations to attach them, right? You have to have at least five acres of a conservation subdivision under existing rules, but you cannot attach those units unless you have 10 or more acres as it's currently constructed in the law. So it's not multifamily. These are single family residences, either detached or attached. They have the same density and height as a conventional subdivision. So there is no change as it relates to density, number of units. You must show, as you know, how many units you can get in a subdivision, and then why you know making a conservation development would basically preserve environmental features and be better for the environment. Clearly, they can be more protective of the environment than traditional conventional subdivisions. And the other benefit that's sought and, and often in these is that they create more contiguous open space to the extent that you're both attaching units and or you know, clustering them closer together, obviously you're providing uh, an opportunity to have what our current plan says, opportunities for a pedestrian connectivity between sites, public or private, I might add. Um, so there is that opportunity by benefit of conservation. The other thing I hear a lot, and, and frankly we don't talk about in the plan, there's two things we avoided, like the plague in this plan. One is the word character, community character, just because of the history of land use planning, what that means. Um, very often it's been used in the past for, you know, to represent other things. It's almost sort of a dog whistle about what does community character mean and who belongs where. So we made sure as one white plains not to use the word character. The other thing I didn't talk about on purpose is property values. To me, land use planning documents that are led with protecting property values has the same effect. So to the extent that people are concerned that this type of development will actually reduce property values is totally incorrect. And we did an analysis of the sales prices of our eight conservation developments, they're all incredibly expensive, way beyond, over a million dollars, way beyond the average housing unit price in the city of White Plains, which is a $612,000 full average of everything in White Plains. So to think that these are in any way going to impact property values is not accurate. Add to the city's, go ahead. And can I say, since you're talking about conservation subdivision, what is the difference with clustering? We don't, we don't have any representation. Well, we have con that's the only way you can, there's I mean, you no. you talk about clustering. I think there's a confusion that yes, people have. Yes, yes. I thought it was sort of the same. Well, conservation, it allowed you, you, know, it allows you to cluster things with different, you to cluster. exactly. Isn't exactly. that, the, so it's not a, something in addition to that. No, the okay. only, and that's probably, the only place we talk about clustering at all in the current was in the future having another, so the conservation subdivision regulation has very specific criteria, right? So very often communities have various clustering techniques that may adhere to different areas of the city based on environmental features, based on lot size, based on typology of land use um, and the like, or even types of housing land, but not in any way. Yes, you're clustering in a conservation, you're clustering things usually closer. I might add there's also an additional requirement in conservation subdivision that you have to be 50 feet from the lot line, so setbacks, both front, street, side yard, which is in every case more substantial than conventional zoning setbacks, except for the R130 district front yard, which is 75 feet. But everywhere else, it's 50 feet, and I might add, it adds kind of a better buffer to the area. So, and it also adds the city's housing options and choices. So what we did in the Live White Plains and what the community was clamoring for was housing option and choice. I can't tell you how many times I go to neighborhoods around the city and people say, I wish my kids could afford to live in the city. I wish they could stay in the city. Nobody wants to live in small apartments that are $7,000 a month, people tell me. I wish they could afford to live here. These are the ways. And conservation subdivisions are expensive. That's not the only way. But these options and housing choices, to me, are the way to create other options aside from the very wonderful single family neighborhoods we have and still preserve and protect the environment. So again, all these districts, you can do a conventional subdivision. This is on the books, it's permitted. Myths I won't go into, they're not multifamily. I said that this is the obverse, of course. Value, value, they permit more density and height, no, no, no. I mean, the damage of neighborhoods, I mean, I'll let you make your own, I mean, we all know the eight that are in the city. I don't think we'd say that about the current conservation developments, damaging character. Um, and so existing regulations, I know this was something I wanted to put together to explain sort of what you could do now in the city 
and then what is in one of the live initiatives, which will be a great talking point. So right now, as I said, you must have at least five acres in specific zones, some of the residential zones, to do this. Um, I did map them, right? So there's about eight of them right now. This doesn't include assemblage, clearly, but there's eight of them. Most of them are religious institutions that meet that. Of course, we didn't include the our existing sites that have them already. Um, and then 10 acres is where you can actually have a conservation development that is attached, or housing is attached. So there's eight properties right now, mainly New York Presbyterian, Burke, uh, Stepanek High School, LaFell School. So these are privately owned. Um, what else is there? We have German School, I think, right? So these are, you know, we have about 15 to 16 properties that would probably be right now without any significant assemblage uh, available for these. Most of them are occupied. Almost none of them are vacant. Uh, but that is where the site. And these are the districts. So one other thing I'll say, they are permitted in the R130 district. Um, so yes, a lot of the R130 zoning, which is our least dense single family, you need 30,000 square feet. Um, many of those properties, by virtue of being golf courses, et cetera, are excluded based on the current subdivision regulations. So you can do it in the R130, but just in a limited scope. Hence the inability on the French American school, former French American Pharrell subdivision site. I just added this in because this was actually the language, and I won't read it, but this is actually the language from 1980 that was when the city adopted conservative legislation, this is the reason why. So again, it's an option, it's a choice, but it's all about the environmental quality and really making sure to minimize negative impacts. So again, it provides flexibility. Um, can I just ask? Yes. You can have a large site like Ridgeway yes. that, let's face it, doesn't have a lot of trees. Their trees are all in the middle of the property. Yeah, yeah, the so in terms of the buffer around, just because they're a certain size and there may be a change to the subdivision regulations in the future, yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean that it can automatically be a conservation subdivision. Exactly. It needs to meet some of those things that you address. 100%. There, have There's to be stan there are standards. Yes. There needs to be you know, setbacks. Early, you yeah. need to be able to show that the environmental features, absolutely. The roadway network has to be able to function, obviously. Um, so, just to close, I mean, these are the eight that we have in the city now. Um, and I wound up, we did an analysis to figure out the percent of open space. So the beauty of this is that it's 193 acres in these eight existing conservation developments. So what are they? I, I only think of, I always think of club I, I, points. Lynn, and... I knew the question was coming. Look at this. <laughs> Wyndham Close. Good. Ridgeway at White Plains. Ridgeway at White Plains. Where is that? All right. Oh, whatever. You, see it? you can see it up there on the map. Then we have the greens. The greens. No. Glenbrook. Cobble Fields. Okay. All right. Brook Hills. Gedney Commons, Club Point. Okay, right. So there's eight of them. Most of them, I think all of them approved in the 80s and 90s, yeah. right, Eileen? Only a couple in, in the 90s, early 90s. And super, super developments, as yeah. you said. So again, we did analysis for the last two or three years, even post-COVID. I mean, these are extremely valuable properties. Um, so I want people to... So minimum required setbacks. I won't get into this, but this is kind of what I referenced about what actually these eight projects have in terms of setbacks relative to what on the right few columns would, be a, would have been required if they were done conventionally. So you start seeing these required setbacks um, being very significant vis-a-vis -vis what would have been required. Interestingly, you know, some are attached, some are detached, some are both. Um, so it all depends on the lot size. So I think, and this is just showing an example of a 25-foot setback in terms of you know, rear yard setbacks in some cases versus a 50-foot setback. So a typical convention on the left versus what a 50-foot in that same district that allows a convent, you know, a more of a cluster to, to actual create that green belt. You know, that's sort of the way of thinking sustainability, right? So you have convention on the left with a setback, right? And then you have the one on the right, which is how you clustered things a little bit closer together to maximize the green space and the green belt around the development. So that just shows an example of what's possible. And again, these are some of our other ones just showing the green space that's contiguous. 30 foot there, 100 foot in this situation. So, and I won't get into more of that, but um, the recommendation in LIV, there is a recommendation that we, we heard from the Conference of Plan Committee and others to permit, and this is something for sure we've heard a lot of folks in the neighborhood's concerned about, to now permit in the future with conservation developments attaching homes 
if, with a threshold of five acres, not the 10 acres that's currently on the books. So that's in the plan right now. I know the council's heard a lot about, maybe it'll disappear, but that's where it is right now. Um, because the idea was on some of those smaller lots, there's a benefit to clustering. You have more constrained opportunity. Um, so that was that. And final, final, I keep saying that I know. Um, that's how I keep you interested. Is um, there are a couple sites in the south end of the city I know that have both uh, changed hands recently and perhaps will in the future, one being the Windward School, which I believe is just about at five acres. Um, we've had a lot of interest in the past about that, but I think you can get a certain density of conventional, whether it's 10 houses, 12, whatever it ends up being. Uh, the ability to cluster that if this were changed, the law, would have the same number of units. It would just provide greater green space and a much deeper setback from the street there. So you know, those are things, again, whether the policy's in here when it gets adopted or not, in any case would require zoning change before the Common Council to amend the regulations to allow attaching of homes on five acres or more as opposed to 10 acres. So there's that, um, and you know, that's it. That's conservation of elements. The good news is of the 147 elements, um, you know, we've, we've had a lot of support for a lot of them, and I think we've had some really robust discussion, and we'll see what the council has to say about, about a lot of it. Could you just speak to the issue of the senior housing? In other words, there is, I forgot, it's live something or other. The idea of senior housing being allowed in Nor single family neighborhoods. In, there's that's a, the way I read it, or am I misreading that's, it? The North Street Corridor has been a, a challenge for the city, and I hear it from the North Street um, Neighborhood Association all the time. As we know, there's a, a multitude of religious institutions, right, both long standing on that quarter mm -hmm. and new, including a, that spec church that came in that could approve that. Um, rent a church. Rent a church, which apparently is very successful. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and apparently it's, it's come out nice. But um, I guess what I'm saying is we've gotten a lot of concern of, like, why do we keep getting these churches? And the answer is there's very little allowed on that quarter besides religious uses, mm -hmm. and they're as of right. They're not even special permits, so that's something we'd look into. We have had a lot of institutions with a lot of land on that stretch have interest in doing some level of townhouses, et cetera, that would not be permitted. So the thought was in the conference of plan to acknowledge that the future of that quarter, particularly with a lot of these institutions, some of which might not be there in 15 years, what is the future of North Street? It's not going to be single family homes. We know that for a fact. It's a very challenging quarter. The land values don't. So does the city want to look at opportunities there, maybe special permits to either have attached townhouses, townhomes, it's in there because it's been something that's been both brought up by the community um, and frankly something by the religious organizations that own a lot of land. They're land rich. But the future of that quarter we should plan for, whether that is single family housing or is it townhouses or is it an opportunity to create in limited circumstances senior housing that's so much needed in the city. Because uh, live or whatever it is, live, White Plains. Oh, I like six. live. Number live, six. I like that. Yeah. That seemed to be more open ended than just North Street. It says senior and assisted housing in residential neighborhoods. It didn't seem to be limited just to North Street. Oh, there's a North Street one too. I'm sorry. Well, I, I know didn't there was a North Street one, which we can talk about that later. Oh, but um, I just thought that six was more open ended, and that might have been where some. People were concerned about that. For assisted living facilities. Senior and assisted. Right. And of course, we're not, you know, I don't want to take up all the time. No, take, this is what it's here for, Lynn. I mean, there's absolutely also no guarantee, since I've been on the planning board, that any of these developments result in affordable units. Yes, the zone may require a couple of things get set aside, but. They're not. But yeah, live, is that it? Live? White Plains 6. It said senior and assisted housing in residential, and it did say single family neighborhoods. So I was thinking windward. Also, again, we know this is probably not going to happen, but Westchester Hills, even Ridgeway. I mean, just because we may be approving a subdivision doesn't mean that a developer five years from now, like the French American School was approved by the council that somebody comes in with something new. So, you know, it might be just something for you to think about. No, it's a what, great what, what point. You, it's what, a great point. About. It's a great point, and I totally, I, I, the senior aspect of it, because we heard that a lot, it wasn't just about housing affordability across all neighborhoods, which we know is the biggest concern. That's the biggest thing we heard throughout this, but senior in particular. 
So the assisted living is one thing, right? right. The senior housing is another. Um, the only way, to be quite frank, that you know we were seeing opportunities for any of this in the future, you know, in terms of having any level of senior affordable housing, is to unlock land potential, right? It's very, very challenging to have. And most of these are two or three story buildings, right? So I think this started with North Street, and that's my mistake because I know we made some changes on North Street one as well. But all this thinking was because of these religious institutions and some of these other areas, sort of on the fringe of the central parking area where perhaps there's opportunity for senior. Again, it's senior and assisted living. Um, it's not unrestricted residential. And, and the thought was that when we talk about senior house and we talk about less impact to the schools, we talk about less impact for traffic, if you're gonna broach that challenging kind of uh, zoning paradigm, you do it with senior and assisted living where the resources and sort of the infrastructure demands are less. And so I think that's what we're talking about, capitalized with nonprofits, for example. Um, a lot of it's talking about existing buildings, too. We do have several opportunities to look at dilapidated buildings that could become affordable projects with use of city resources. So for better or worse, some of those opportunities are in single-family zoning districts, to be completely frank. But the idea here was looking at senior housing and assisted living sort of as a different category of multifamily, if you will, than unrestricted multifamily. It comes with other um, environmental impacts, I'll say, in terms of traffic school kids. So, but that was a very good catch, and I know the origin of that did well, come from, I don't know and that's something for us to not. consider in terms of how that gets <laughs> sussed out. Chris, if I remember correctly, when we were part of the CPC as well, one of the points, it was directly related to the ADUs as well that was brought yeah. up, because a lot of people were talking about having an ADU on their property so they can support their aged or aging parents and mm -hmm. others, and that will be beneficial as well for them. Exactly, and that's referenced in there to ADUs and, and seniors, exactly. Chris, I'd like you to clarify something for the people watching, the people that might be here. I've taken at least a half a dozen calls in the last three or four weeks. The rumor mill is quite active uh, <laughs> about what's going on at Ridgeway and what has been proposed. Okay. I mean, I can do it, you can. I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. In terms of what is the in the environmental site. the country club oh. site, I mean, to date we have seen absolutely nothing that indicates anything other than single-family detached homes for the Ridgeway site, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm I'm hearing all sorts of questions about multifamily housing and six-story buildings being built on no, it. Yeah. None of that has been proposed. We've seen absolutely nothing yeah. uh, to date. Now, that's not to say we might not see it in the future, but right now we're evaluating and waiting for the DEIS for single-family homes on the yep. site. Yep, and the alternatives as well, I'll add. Remember, there's alternatives yep. that, the, that the planning board put into that scope that you adopted. So, yes, it's their preferred alternative, right, for the approximately 100 lots. Um, you know, something that's also, everything's full circle, right? Um, if you remember, the proposed alternative has de facto almost a clustered look on parcel A, right? And why is that, yes. right? And, and, and a lot of it is to protect the environmental features, which you all as this body has the ability to do under our code. But it's funny because there's definitely been folks in the neighborhood that reached out to me that said, well, why don't we rezone some of the parcels to allow clustering? Or why don't we, we love this approach and the way they're achieving it on parcel A requires the proof to this body that by virtue of making those smaller lots for seniors, right? The idea and this clubhouse potentially, is to protect the environment and to give a better buffer off Ridgeway. Imagine that, going down Ridgeway, not just seeing the back of people's pools, but you see this large green buffer. Beneficial, right? Yeah. But you know what that is? That's another clustering technique. That's exactly what the comprehensive plan on the book says right now. But yet, the city doesn't have the ability to do that. The only mechanism is through the conservation development and your all authority to alter based on environmental features. Those long, weird lots. Those, yeah, those challenging things. So. You know, I mean, hey, zoning and all those setbacks in the R-130 when the city rezoned that particular lot, the 127 acres, provides 30,000 square foot minimum lot sizes, very substantial setbacks. It works in some of the areas. If you look at that area, the way it's laid out, the 75 front yard looks great in some areas. Other areas, it's a little more challenging. Other areas it provides, so yes, it got rezoned to the R-130, the least, um, you know, the least dense, the, the most restrictive residential. But there are opportunities there, and even the developers seeing it, and even the neighborhood, frankly, saying, wait, wouldn't it be nice if we could preserve this or that? So zoning is uh, an evolving concept. 
so yes, to answer your question, Chairman, like the EIS, my understanding, Eileen and I have talked to the applicant in the next couple months. They're finalizing the EIS. You'll see that first draft for consideration. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I'd come sit there a little less formal, right? There's a, I was going to ask one more general question. Sure. Next steps are so after today. Yes. Common Council is going to have another hearing, a public yep. hearing. They haven't closed it; it's nope. still open. And then what happens? So the Common Council has to complete an environmental review, right? So an analysis of sort of what the general recommendations are here before adopting the plan itself. Um, so if I were a betting person, which I'm not, um, you know, the public hearing on March 4th. Uh, clearly, people have the opportunity to be heard whether the council decides to close that hearing depending on the level of comment or open it or continue it to April is up to the council, clearly. But in any case, they won't be able to adopt a comprehensive plan. And again, the purpose of the public planning process is to make specific edits to the document. Your role in the process and why I'm here, well, I'm always here, but the reason I'm here to talk about this is that obviously as sort of one of the boards that has the most sort of uh, we kind of put you in here, and a lot of the implementation committee, the planning board in the future will clearly be involved in land use policy changes that the city might propose um, or that you might want to come forward with. Uh, so to the extent that the planning board has public comments or a written comment, even in a general sense, back to the common council, you know, in the record of the public hearing, I think is beneficial. Um, and it can be a specific or general or concerns about language on page 37 or whatever, you know, Lynn had noted. Um, and of course, we'll take that all under advisement and can make those changes. We're going to be asked to write a letter to the council mm -hmm. with our opinions on the comprehensive draft. And I mean, we're clearly not going to do that this evening because there's, there's a lot more that has to be done, at least from my perspective. But there are several of these initiatives that are going to come flat in front of the planning board if they come to fruition. Uh, and I think those merit some discussion amongst the board itself. So, you know, because again, I have no idea how anybody feels about the document other than perhaps Vanilla because we were involved in its creation. Your document. Uh, you're right, right. With, so of course you love it. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it, there's many good things about it. There's many it things about it that I don't yeah. love. Uh, but all of that said, uh, and we're not going to be able to complete all of, all yeah. of our due diligence tonight, but I would like to have this on the agenda for the March meeting and everybody on the board will have a chance to go over and bring some things specific that you might personally want to see included in the letter to the council. Uh, and obviously you could pick up a hard copy. I find it easier to work off a hard copy, but again, many people like to look at it on, on, on a computer. So once we have those comments, we have to formulate a detailed letter to the council as to what we think we would like to see done with this document. Okay. Are, are, is, is the rest of the meeting for us to ask Chris yeah. questions, or how, how did you want to handle the rest it, of this, it, sir? It can take any form we want it to take. I would like to go through quickly, because each of them are going to take some discussion, but if you go into the implementation phase of this, and if you look at the, on, towards the right side, the implementation leads, uh, and any place planning board is mentioned, we should at least make oh, note okay. of, those of those items. Chris, uh, can you pull that up? Do you have a list of those, John? Because yeah, I don't. I, think uh, we, I mean, I could pull it up online. That are planning uh, board related? Um, yeah, I mean, I was thinking we could suss that out. Not in an easy format now, but I can definitely scroll and we could see them quickly if that helps. I was going to say, after this meeting, we'll do that. We'll circulate to you all Which just a truncated that list. That, that we would be involved yeah. with yeah. in the future. And that if there's great. ones that you're not listed as an invitation lead, doesn't mean you wouldn't necessarily be involved. But if you think you want to be listed, then that's a comment as well. And we and can comment on any, yeah. on any initiative. Yeah, it but doesn't, yeah, it's wide open, guys. Okay. But I did have so some other me, questions for Chris at some point. Sure, keep them coming. That's As I'm sure other people do, too. Yeah, this is, this is a good time for individual questions of the commissioner. So anybody please pipe up if there are any. I, I did at some point want you to talk more about the ADUs. Okay. Um, I, um, I've lived in my plans, many people know for a long time. 
our, our family, and we still have the fifth generation mm -hmm. of Oliva and Johnsons that live in Battle Hill. Wow. So I'm very, very familiar with that neighborhood. I grew up there, and that neighborhood, Fisher Hill, and some others really has needed a lot of protection. And mm -hmm. the Neighborhood Association, hats off to them for all of the decades of their being vigilant. Because there are houses, there are other things where there does get to be a lot of overcrowding. You know there, Chris, some of the streets are narrow. Very much so. Uh, you've got people parking there. So with the ADUs, the way I read it, it sounded as if, um, and I know some of those that were permitted, the building permit department allowed some units up there mm -hmm. for mothers or you know family members. Then they moved and they rented it out. Yes. To and you know some were fine, some were not so fine. So that's I guess something more about how you handle that uh, in the future. But um, I thought I read with the ADUs that the thinking of this the staff and the consultants were that most of these ADUs might be on larger parcels, not necessarily Battle Hill, where they'd have to battle this all over again. Yeah. Or, um, or um, is, is that, like, what, what, that, what that neighborhoods? Was, that was the thinking. It's where not, are these larger parcels? Where well, this the, the thought was obviously, and again, it's for study. The recommendation, Live White Plains 1, is talking a lot about making sure that there's areas that can, there's two ways to think of an ADU, either in the building itself, right, right or as an out building, right, as sort of an accessory dwelling unit that's not attached. And that's very much considering sort of setback requirements. Parking requirements, to me, is going to be a huge thing, right? right, because we know that's often an issue in Battle Hill, no matter, even under existing zoning, the inability to meet those. Um, coverage requirements, there's something in there that totally that recommends, which the city, I think, does need, is a really strong coverage requirement we don't have across districts, and that would apply to future accessory buildings as well as ADUs. So really it's looking at districts that, yeah, that aren't the, we know that the close in neighborhoods that are incredibly dense already would be challenging depending on how this city were to study the potential for ADUs. If, if the goal was to get as many ADUs in the city as possible, that's a very different approach, right? And I don't think that's our intent. Then looking at ways to surgically open up opportunities on lots that can accommodate the traffic impacts, the environmental impacts, the coverage impacts, Long way of saying, I don't foresee us permitting them in the close and high dense neighborhoods, which by the way, already very often have two family zoning, three family zoning, et cetera. So this really is for areas, and I've heard comments about the ADUs for a better part of a year. Some people think it's the greatest idea in the world, right? And some people think it's the worst idea in the world. And it's one of these things where, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I think you're stud So you're going to do a study, a real... That's what the recommendation is. And we identify. If you look that's at that's going to really help because I'm on both sides of it, to be honest with you. If you look you at know, Live White Plains 1, and I should probably pull it up there, it's very specific about the things that the city needs to consider. And we didn't just pull this out of the ether, right? Like, there's many of the communities, I don't know if... Scarsdale and, and, you know, <laughs> Lazy Tunnel. I mean, a lot of planners around the region. It's not new territory. It's, frankly, to be, <laughs> it's how, how many of them do we want to see, right? There's communities in Westchester that have done award-winning ADU legislation, and I can tell you they haven't resulted in a single accessory dwelling unit right. because they're that restrictive. So is it to put, you know, something out there that's not going to achieve anything, or is it, you know, so there's a happy middle ground, and I'm not pointing at Liz because of Scar. I'm a, but there's other communities that have done it, so we have recommendations. And so Live One has a whole bunch of stuff. Um, there's things you can do to incentivize, right? You can do stuff even, I know in other communities, the building permit fees can be uh, an exorbitant part of, of legal, not legalizing, creating a legal ID unit under the framework of an, a law that gets created. So do you want to streamline that process? Do you want to have to come to the planning board for a special permit to have an ADU? All things, you're shaking your head now, but all things that we'd have to consider. Come because to somebody, the, though. <laughs> yeah, is it just the building department? Is, you know, do you have to have two parking spaces on site, you know, or, or one, or, you know, those sorts of things. So, um, so that's all to be looked at and also yes. doing some areas where there could be potential requests to see whether it would work or not. Right. So pilot. you haven't decided already. 100% pilot. Okay, that. so yeah. it's still open and people will be able to, to comment on that to see if it could work uh, under certain circumstances. That's good. Yeah, and I, let me just say to that point, Lynn, like I learned the hard way um, having adopted a comprehensive plan in Port Chester before I got here, a great plan 
we also did associated zoning amendments at the same time. And some of the zoning amendments were fairly controversial. And it really, in my mind, detracted from sort of the overall vision statement being adopted in a timely fashion um, because we got hung up on the hyper detail. So the idea here was to lay out a roadmap and be specific. We want to study the ADU. These are the things we would do if we were to adopt legislation. But the legislation is not part of this adoption, right? So you're hitting on kind of what we were trying to think from the get-go. Have a strong policy document, but we know we're going to have to study and pilot things because there's no way to just blanket say ADUs everywhere in, in the city with no regulation. That's not the intent here. So, but Live White Plains one, if you look, has a lot on ADUs and best practices, what they've done in other places. If you're done on the ADUs, I I love ADUs for the most part, but they have to be tailored to the neighborhood, and the studies are going to be. Critical yes. to moving any exactly. of this. I think as I went through this document, I came up with easy half a dozen or, or ten different studies that were recommended from ADUs to downtown streets to. Mm -hmm. So Closing all of streets, this, I yeah. think, is echoing what Chris is saying is that let's take a look at these. But one thing I didn't understand, and it may be because I'm relatively new, the um, missing middle housing that we you talked about, uh -huh. um, expanding the business RM um, district. How does that work? That was. Live 15. Yeah, 15. I mean, so, what does that really entail? So, what, what we've Again, what I've, recommendation. What I've realized um, in my time here, and what we've recognized is that the city has some significant density that's permitted, as we know, our central parking area, which is basically the core of our downtown. So, if you look at the zoning map for the policy and zoning wonks out there, we have a CB1, a C, central business 2, central business 3 all provide a lot of density opportunities, you know, 50, 60 acre, you know, units break or whatever the math ends up being. And then we have a lot of much lower density districts that are immediately surrounding our downtown. And there's not that middle range density. So the city, uh, three years ago, we brought forth a really targeted zoning change in our central CB2 district, which permitted what you see at the old frozen rope site, right? It was a large site that had been derelict for a long time. It's gonna be an eight story building right in the heart of our downtown, transitional to some of the larger districts, that wasn't permitted on that corridor. Um, the Court Street lot that Westchester County owns where the mm -hmm. Board of Elections is, yeah. those areas as well. The county's had a lot of designs to do a six, seven, eight story building there. The zoning permits only four or five. Um, so we were thinking that's the only district, the RM.7, that allows that kind of mid-range density, which to me is perfect for ringing. It provides opportunity around the core of our downtown to provide much needed housing, affordable options, reasonable transitional height into neighborhoods. Um, and frankly, if you look at our zoning code and get to the numbers, we have the high and we have much more constrained opportunities. So being targeted to, and then the one thing I'll say also is um, the RM district we have along Maple Avenue. If you look at Maple Avenue scale as you get into Carhartt, you know that we have that sort of nice transition from what are larger buildings down to the neighborhood. Those were all predicated and achieved, I should say, based on a set-aside requirement of 20% affordable housing. So we do have the opportunity, if we're thinking RM7, but I think there's something better. I think there's a way to kind of incentivize that four or five or six story additional height from three to six or three to seven by maybe having an affordable housing set-aside requirement that's much more substantial in the city's current. So long-winded way of saying there's opportunity to fine-tune the zoning right around the core of the downtown, recognizing that all the neighborhoods, you know, um, you know, there's a cognizant step down to the neighborhoods like we have already. So, so that's that. But it doesn't specifically, like on our map, we don't say this block, you no, know. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. something we'd have to study. That's like we fine. would do when I present to the Common Council, like this is our recommendation. Um, and this is why, right? So. So can I ask, how much housing do we need? I mean, when I was with Westchester County, mm -hmm. and it may very well have changed, there was what the Rutgers studies. A yeah. lot of things where they looked at how much yeah. housing a community could, should, should provide, particularly affordable housing. A lot of it, and again, it may have changed in recent years, yeah. it was all based on employment. Yeah. Of course, in, West, in White Plains, as an example, no ANS, no Macy's, no Sears, yeah. no JCPenney, no, uh, I mean, a Walmart. Uh, a lot of employment things in White Plains mm -hmm. aren't here anymore. So 
when we're talking about all of this housing and we're mm -hmm. doing things downtown and sure. taking advantage of, you know, the transit stuff is a very good idea. We've got yep. the huge development being proposed for uh, the Galleria. We're talking about North Street, and you and I can, or we all mm -hmm. can talk about that later. How much housing do we need? If this came to fruition, how many millions of people are going to live here? <laughs> or, so um, I'm just curious, what is this based on oh, all this additional how much housing time? in yeah. Fringe areas and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you know next to the core area. I'm wondering where yeah. it's coming that we have to or yeah, yeah. should develop all of that. Yeah, let me start with this a great question. So there's so many ways to attack that. Like first of all, a lot of what we're talking about from some of this fringe or the RM7 medium density housing, a lot of it is what we'd call infill housing, right? It's opportunities either in areas where there's a two or three story building or a couple two family homes that so we're increasing density in some marginal way. But it's not like we're, you know, building a massive increase in density over, over vacant land. Um, so there's, like, targeted opportunities where we have aging housing stock. I mean, there's a lot of areas right around the fringe that if we want to provide affordable opportunities, because that's what's, I mean, let's be honest, the biggest driver of a lot of the comments we heard was that even if the jobs at NS were here, or Alexander's, where my father used to work in the 60s, like, you can't afford to live in the average rental apartment in White Plains anyway, right? So how do we provide more housing, not just affordable housing, big A, regulated by the city, state, county, but providing housing supply. And that's the biggest national issue right now. It's total supply. And it's not going to be met just through upzoning and downtown developments. It's about how do we open up other range of opportunities? How do we create more townhouses in Westchester County? To me, that's a huge opportunity where there's people that want to downsize, people aren't leaving their houses because of interest rates, all these other macroeconomic forces. So it's not just about providing um, more houses beyond. A lot of it's infill. A lot of it's work from home. A lot of it's people want to live where the action is, live in downtowns. People are coming back to downtowns. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily coming to White Plains because they want to work at Heineken. It's a great benefit to work downtown at Heineken at Sumitomo. But what they are doing is recognize they want that lifestyle, right? They want the, the active urban lifestyle, maybe at a slight discount to New York City, perhaps, um, and can work from home, can work from anywhere. So it's not necessarily people... Um, moving downtown White Plains because they want to work at, you know, the Danones or, you know, these other jobs have come. I will also say that it's a great problem to have. I mean, I've worked in other communities. I talked to many other planners, even in this region. Um, you want people to want to be here in White Plains, right? I always say the city's a living organism. Any city is. And housing, a lot of this housing is replacing what was that big office boom in the 80s. So it's cyclical, right? We have a lot of things that have been converted. Look at 440 Hamilton. You know, look at uh, the Pace Lubin Business Center down at City Square. Um, think about all the development along the train station. Those are all office buildings that are now converted. So in a lot of ways, people say, where's all the traffic going to go? And I say, well, if you think about it, those office floor plates and the, the, the thousands of people that were commuting inbound to the city are no longer doing that, right, because we have less office workers than we did in the 80s. And all these people that are living downtown, either taking the train to work, walking to work, or out commuting in the morning. So from a traffic perspective, it's a boom, right? We have activity. The other thing is now we're supporting the North Residential Downtown, which the 1997 plan and 2006 plan hit perfectly. How do we support local business? I hear on the one hand people saying we can't have any more housing downtown, but I would love America Avenue to be like it was in the 1980s and 90s with all these independent stores. And I said we need to support the Mitchell, I understand, has done a great job at you know, we've gotten two more coffee shops because the Mitchell and other downtown development is clustered now, a sort of density, a viable density to support local businesses that aren't, you know, multinational corporations. So it's sort of like the housing, I will also say, that we've approved. Um, there's 3,000 units under development right now. We've approved even more than that. But it's like anything. In economic cycles, the city's constantly approving projects. Some will go, and unfortunately, some won't. So... It's not as if everything that the city approves in economic cycles will always get built. So I was kind of a rambling answer, but everybody has this issue. The other thing is demographic shifts. We have the school district. If you look at their demographics, with all the development we've had, they actually have a decline in enrollment, and they're projecting a, a pretty significant decline in enrollment in the next few years. So everybody was concerned that, oh, my God, everybody's building housing. The answer is these are small units. They're not generating as many kids. And frankly, the macro forces of just birth rates in general are, are kind of a bigger issue. So now we have communities closing schools in parts of Westchester. So um, it's a long answer, but it's a good problem to have. 
What my big thing, though, is making sure the city is diligent in making sure a lot of these buildings have active streetscapes. It's not just about getting the people, but it's making sure we maintain and enhance, whether it's Hamilton Avenue, parts of the Maranek Avenue. So yes, you're building more residential, but we're making sure that mixed use component is there to kind of achieve a lot of the streetscape goals we have. Because without that, you know, where do, where do, where do people go? We don't want them all on Amazon and working from home. We want them supporting our local businesses. I did right. want to add that uh, there was a housing composition as mm -hmm. it exists currently, but we also looked at the growth that we've seen over the past, even the five years, I think, in the population mm -hmm. and how many more people there are in the city right now versus five years ago. And going back to your demographics component, we even looked at the age group mm -hmm. groups that exist in the city right now, and predominantly it's between the 72, I would say, I think, 40, 45, or 49 mm -hmm. kind of age group. That's more and more people. Mm -hmm. So where these people will want to be thinking and living and uh, like you said, downtown, more like the urban culture. I mean, speaking on behalf of kind of like the millennials, I guess, myself too, uh, the expectations of what it means, because you're talking about long term, it's for the next, the coming generations too, right, over the next decade or even longer than that. So what does that mean and where exactly are we going to see the shift is something that we had extensively discussed during the comprehensive planning committee meetings as well and things were brought up. And that is where part of the justification for what we're seeing as housing growth and development, continued development, kind of made sense. Well, the other issue, I mean, this is where housing becomes extremely difficult. We, I hear all the time that the affordable housing units, and we have a great program, I have a lot of friends that are in it, are not affordable. and. True enough, I mean, if you make less than 50 or 55 or $60,000, you don't even qualify to get into the affordable program, number one. But what you have to look back on, and as noble as it is for the city to require these developers to create affordable units, that is part, partly what is driving the uptick in market rents because the developers are looking to recoup the money that they lose it's on, on the affordable units. Exactly. And that's what's driven the market rents up problem. But what will hopefully bring some of the market prices down is more inventory. Supply. Yeah. If, I mean, the supply is pretty tight right now. We have waiting lists for different size apartments in the affordable program. If there were no waiting lists and if there were substantial vacancies, not that that's a good thing for the city, but if there are vacancies, it's going to put some pressure, downward pressure, on these rents, which are, I mean, they're spiraling, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at five or six or seven percent a year. I mean, one bedrooms now are thirty two hundred or thirty three hundred dollars, and this. Back to what Vanella said a few minutes ago, and we had this discussion a variety of times at the comprehensive plan meetings, you have a younger generation that doesn't want to stay home and save money to, to be able to buy something. So they leave the nest, they go rent, and that almost ensures their lack of being a homeowner, their inability to become a homeowner for a long time as they're paying $3,200 a month, it makes it, puts a lot mm -hmm. of pressure on savings. And especially now that most of the commercial banks and mortgage banks are requiring 20 and 25% down payments, uh, yeah. you almost have to wait for your parents to die to be able to buy a unit. It's the hardest it's, it's been in 50 years to buy a single family home in this country, not just in Westchester or not. It's not just a white plains problem with that, but we have to understand. Yeah. And, and would it, it's a national issue, and, and what it is is. Um, no. Okay. No, and, and part of the issue is that there's a lot of people, discretionary renters. You know, I run into this a lot. If if you look at the demographics of White Plains, we're essentially 50% renters, 50% homeowners, as a population, right? That's very different than a lot of our neighbors, clearly. But there's a lot of folks I talk to in the downtown that have moved to White Plains for all the great things that we've achieved, right? This viable kind of nightlife, opportunities to walk to work smaller city, access to Manhattan, access to 287, um, and they don't have interest in necessarily buying. And if you look at all the reports and all Until the studies, but if you look at all the reports and studies, and that's a good point, yeah, that even the millennials, right, have, have uh, Yeah, just, I have millennial, yeah. and now they have kids, and they're 
love living in Brooklyn, but we need to but talk it's, about it. And that's the thing. It's like, uh, and then the costs, obviously, with interest rates and sort of the cost of housing, lack of inventory. It's, you know, every study shows that right now it's even cheaper for folks to stay. And, and the path to generational wealth or home ownership is not what it was 40 years ago. So it's a different dynamic. And I think Vanilla hit on something really important is that when we look at planning for one-way planes, we're planning for 10, 15, 20, even 30 years out, right? We will tweak this plan 100%, whether I'm here, whoever's here in my stead in the future. Um, but we are planning for the next generation too, and things have shifted a lot, right? So I do tell people a lot, I do hear, and I cringe sometimes, I can't help myself, and when people say the people that rent don't care as much, and I think that's, you know, frankly untrue. First of all, there's a lot of folks investing a lot of money every month and going to stores and restaurants that are choosing to rent. And frankly, a lot of them probably could buy co-ops, et cetera. And they tax write-offs on and, the rent. Yeah, because right, of the salt like deduction. So yeah. But it's hard to kind of dynamic different generations of different matter. experiences. So I'm trying to think like... You should incentivize us to invest in something that you own. But excuse me, that's just an economic fact. But that's 100%. That's, 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 that's true. paying a lot of white plains taxes. Thank you. They are. Also, but also consuming a lot of services per capita, more so than somebody renting in a building. So you could argue both ways. Yes. You also yes. Want to exacerbate the inability to own by taking away inventory that people might be able to buy. Instead, you're increasing the rent, the rent portion of, well, of that that's, ability. That's happening in condominiums yep. Yep. all around the city. Uh, I, I, own a, I own a condominium in White Plains. We used to have five or six units out of 80 that were rented. Now, all of a sudden, we have 20. And what is the reason for that? People are moving on, but the rents are so lucrative. Yeah. Rather than sell the unit, gotcha. they, they rent the unit. And it becomes an opportunity for a developer rather than a resident of White Plains. Well, exactly. But the, the housing is, you know, we'll all lose more hair over. But there's a lot of other parts to this yeah. that are pertinent. And... Lacking any other questions from the board, and you know anybody that has one for the commissioner, and I would ask the commissioner, will you be at next month's planning meeting? Yeah, what's what's the date? Just 19th. to make sure. the nineteenth. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because I, I'd like us to take time to go through this, to pull out specific items, put them on paper, and we'll carve out twenty or thirty minutes in next month's meeting, and perhaps be in a position where we're ready to draft a letter to the common council. Uh, Chairman Roberts, do, do you mind if I say like a, a minute? minute? Oh, sure. Last week. Uh, I, I spent some more questions. Yeah, oh, I'm please. Sorry. Yeah. My apologies. I had a question. Okay, so continue. There you go. You go. Yeah. Um, I just had a question with regard to the section on parking, mm -hmm. and it referenced the various parking lots. Um, on Harlem Avenue, for example, you can't get a parking space. It's all permit parking. Mm -hmm. So you go there, you try to park, and you can't. Um, right behind uh, City Hall here, the whole first floor now is dedicated to the city vehicles. So you almost can't find parking. So I don't know if those numbers for the entire complex of, of, of spaces is what went into the plan or the actual spaces that you could park in. Oh, so that's just, a good question. So capacity versus what's being... What's actually available because... It's not just totally and those worse. are just the two that I'm the most familiar with. Yeah, not the MTA probably in that location. Yeah, so my follow-up to that is, is there monitoring of this? Like, are there stats where people say they are underused, they yeah. need to divvy it up differently? So the city um, and the parking commissioner, of course, some of the commissioners were heavily involved in, in the plan and reviewing some of these initiatives. I think Connect One, right? Connect White Plains One, if I remember correctly, the numbering is all about sort of this extensive parking study that is not just about, we have a good handle. I mean, to answer your question, we have a good handle. The parking commissioner, Kevin Livingston, expert in parking and what the capacity is, what the opportunities are, how do we get to the next level as it relates to technology, to you know, issue tickets and to be more creative in terms of how we monitor parking capacity, um, particularly around some of the transit stations and stops. The private parking capacity is what interests me because as a planner, you look at a lot of the office buildings that were approved at a different time, and there's buildings around here, actually, even from this room, you can see that you know, probably have some capacity. They were approved at a time, maybe under zoning, maybe they over, you know, provided too much. We know for a fact there's certain institutions that lease, you know, probably not legally, that lease some of their vacant spots because they have a zoning requirement and they don't need it because either the building's half empty, et cetera, et cetera. So 
a way to look at, again, the synergies between public and private capacity and sharing and opportunities as relate to downtown development because it behooves nobody, no matter which side of the aisle you are on parking. Some people love parking. Some people think we should have no more parking in the city. Everybody should walk. The bottom line is it's very costly to create either structured parking here in the city, and we have a pretty high water table going deep underground after two stories. It's very costly as well. So when you look at some of our parking requirements and the recommendations for this parking study, looks at you know really progressive ways to share. It looks at some of the parking requirements for um, smaller restaurants in the downtown, uh, outdoor entertainment. A lot of those requirements have been on the books since 1980, 81 in this major zoning update um, need to be evaluated. And the long and short of it is that, that parking study, which we have identified very clearly what needs to be studied, and it's a significant undertaking, I think could unlock a lot of opportunity on the private side. Um, so, and it can also at the same time have us be more creative. Because what happens when somebody's building parking they don't need as part of a development? Is it who's paying for it really, right? Is it the payment in lieu of taxes? Is it White Plains taxpayers helping to foot the bill those extra spaces? There's ways of thinking money is fungible and, and, and how we funding it. And if we're asking for parking that the developer doesn't need and we don't need because we already have capacity, it's incredibly inefficient use of, of resources. So parking study, parking study, I'm parking study. I'm part of your parking study that I think, Eileen, you were at it. There was a planning federation meeting a couple yep. of years ago. It was the best meeting I ever went to, and I've been to a lot. Aside and from these, right? David Mann, <laughs> David Mann, who I don't know if he still develops in White Plains, yeah. but who developed a lot in White Plains, mm -hmm. was one of the speakers. And he talked about how he felt that the jury was still out mm -hmm. on how much parking you really needed for a building downtown. Mm -hmm. He had one building that turned out to be a lot of seniors mm -hmm. along Maple Avenue. Yep. And the, it, it's you, you could you could you know do a roll, bowling ball yeah. down it, and then he had another development along um, North Broadway that nowhere near enough parking yeah. because everybody there was taking um, you know going to 287 yeah. or such. So I'm hoping that when you do do this study, that you get in touch with some of these owners yeah. of buildings who have the information on their income, where they work, because it would be kind of interesting. Uh, to really get some hard data, it which is. now it we is. should be able to get. Well, just and like, I'm sorry, just like we ground truth our student estimates when we have new development, we use very specific White Plains multipliers to say, this type of unit's going to generate X number of school kids, right? We go back with the school district, and we're always kind of ground truth in those mm -hmm. numbers to see. Parking is the same thing. So we talked to David and other developers, and you're right. Oh, it's so location specific, though. So I know exactly which building on, on Maple. He's done a few on that corridor. And even the buildings, based on the composition of who's there, maybe the affordable component, pure unit size, um, proximity to the train station, clearly, um, all have factors. And so 100%. And the economics of it all, right? So there are some buildings that charge 200 bucks a month to park, and there's some that charge 125 And so if your building's $200 and you can park in the city garage a block and a half away for $100 less, you know, so all these macro forces, it's not just, hey, this building has, you know, better capacity, et cetera. So yes, very complicated. And I'm not a parking expert, but thank God we have no, parking experts either. in the parking commission and et cetera. So if we have other questions, do you want us to just write to Chris about them? I mean, for example, one thing, and I'm sure you have a lot to say about it because you sort of mentioned it. One of the things that I didn't see in the plan and as a planning board member, I think a study would be very helpful is this issue of community character. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of developments where what should the building look like? Mm -hmm. uh, should it look more like the other buildings on Fisher Hill? No, no, we don't want to you know, tell people what they really should do. Maybe having a study about various design things would be real helpful to a planning board so that when we're faced with some of these things, yep. we can have a little bit of more better guidance because community character, I mean, I think the character in Battle Hill, Gwen, because I live there, yep. Battle Hill and also Fisher Hill is wonderful. Yep. I like the way those buildings look. Not that some of those buildings don't need to be upgraded, but then you put in a brand new development, and you know the one that I'm talking about. They're like railroad flats yep, yep. down at the end of um, the off of Chatterton, mm -hmm. um, Chatterton Avenue, I guess, a long time ago. Um, I think it, it doesn't fit in at all. So I think the idea of perhaps a study at some point, because you're calling for a lot of different studies, might be well. something helpful so that if you're going to be doing a development in an area, 
you know, be at Battle Hill or, you know, on the Wyndham property or something, or if you're going to be doing things along the corridor mm -hmm. on North Street. Yep. It's not just some big box, which everything is now. You know, you look at buildings now. Am I in Nurse White Plains? Am yeah. I in Yonkers? They all look alike. Uh, it might be a little bit helpful, Chris, to get some yeah. guidance as a study. So design, design guidelines have been in previous, right? We've, we've had other recommendations. In fact, the current comprehensive plan um, mentions design guidelines, right? Mm -hmm. The city did not adopt them. I know it became an issue with the Fisher Hill, right? Oh, um, that I don't know. So. Yeah, no, people brought that up. And having been part of that process in other communities, it's inherently subjective, right, to be clear. I mean, that's a hard thing to, to regulate and legislate. We do have a design review board. Um, yeah, we do have, you know, typically those are the boards that review, but they're advisory in many cases. Right. But if that's something that, you know, this board wants to recommend in terms of really establishing, it's much easier. I've seen it done much more effectively, obviously, in historic districts that have been identified or areas that have a clear, quote, unquote, character right. that's, or maybe traditional subdivisions, like a renal, you know, areas that were subdivided, very clear design guidelines. Right. Um, but then you also get into the challenges of how stringent those guidelines are who is ultimate authority, all things to think about. Um, and sometimes it can be uh, fairly costly to adhere to, right? So th those are things that property owners will have to, you know, they'll come out and have their I mean, I was happy there was a development on Sterling Avenue that, uh, remember, there was, there yeah. was a, the, 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 the home that got knocked down yeah, and they put yeah, six yeah. buildings there. Yeah, yeah. And they had a kind of simple style, but they did end up putting eaves and stuff yeah. on the house. So while it's definitely modern and it's a lot cheaper to construction, it fits in yeah. actually very nicely with the neighborhood. And what about so the it's one, those kind of things. Like across from Cottrell Park there, right? We all approve those. I don't know if people think about those more modern yeah. attached my, my, my Some people love them, some it. people don't. It's, it's to hard to legislate. To, to touch back on something you said earlier, I, I hate the word character mm -hmm. because character can be aesthetic. Yes, it and could it's be. Perspective. It could be demographic. Yeah, well, I it think could be racial. Is, you know, racial. And, and the way the buildings look. Yeah, aesthetic. I, I totally agree That's with what you. I'm thinking when you get past that, I think you're on dangerous oh, territory. No, I'm talking about the aesthetics of it. Yeah. And, um, because you, you could argue that that's all part of the character of a community, and I don't think that's a place that any of us want to go. Oh no. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That, that's I a factor as well. The historic preservation of the plan was great. So yeah, John, no, some good stuff. Very good stuff. Yeah. And that maybe was, that's I'm where it would go. I mean, Lynn, at the very least, so okay. I could see that historic design guidelines. It's like Yonkers question. is very strong historic. When you get outside of that, it's challenging. But that, that, that I like that the historic preservation additions were terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Serena has one. So I have another question. Sure. Um, and I didn't see it or didn't get to it. Um, were, were, okay, any available... Was there a study or is there a list of available lots that the city still owns in the city of White Plains? And, you know, and as Lynn brought up, you know, when we get these projects that come before us mm -hmm. on these substandard lots. Yeah. So, you know, yes. Yeah, so that so my question is, has that been discussed? Is it identified? And are we going are to not plans? sell? Mm -hmm. You know, lots that are causing so many problems um, so when they come before us. That's a great point. We, the real estate committee meets, you know, as needed, right? Arthur's involved in that as well. Um, and we do get things from time to time. I, has it been from the react delay when we, didn't, we yeah. did get rid of a lot of the lots yeah. that were easily developable? Or that are now before the planning board, but not necessarily easily developed. And now we're getting the different ones. <laughs> well, yeah. yes no, I mean, th th there were Once a lot, a battle, there were a lot of battle, wood, 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 Woodcrest. <laughs> I mean, Eileen. Oh, yeah, some, some up there where there were. I'm just could, saying. You couldn't even build. Sun, you couldn't sunset, even sunset, yeah. effectively build a road there <laughs> to connect it. But Eileen gets those possible. calls probably as much as anybody in the planning right. office. And so, I mean, that's not a bad idea to really think about. I mean, obviously, the city. We do a lot on the parkland, what's dedicated parkland, but there are other properties the city does own that aren't dedicated parkland, which in conjunction with some of these foreclosures are tax. Well, they, there haven't been tax foreclosures for a while. Yeah. Probably since we'll, we'll, we'll look into that, sir. It's a great comment. We'll look into like mapping that or just having an inventory in the baseline and what the progress of that is. Yeah, that is we can present that wondering. to the uh, real estate committee and see what we yeah. want to do with those. Have yeah, we, we've has anybody challenged. ever made a, an application to White Plains for mini houses? Mini? 
I talked to somebody, like the sorry. micro, the What's micro like units. Like, Literally 250 I, square foot houses. I think that would be interesting yeah. on some of these I mean, larger properties. There's a couple of there's a couple of TV shows about the oh, development wow. of them Tiny homes, yeah. on cable. Times and has had tons of stories about them. It's I fascinating, think it's, but I mean, I'm just curious if we've ever had any interest in that. We've had interest in micro units, like in buildings where, like for example, yeah. the Chester Avenue, six eight Chester that's going up now. Like okay, those are yeah. some of the smaller. I mean, that's what sixty some odd units, and they're all like. I don't know, 500 square feet, 450. Five, they're they're five, they're small, 500 yeah, some odd. Tiny but you know, there's building older, code yeah. issues. But there yeah. are in other communities, like in this micro ways to yeah. get yeah. density Manhattan, affordability with a small a, right? They think the ones on six eight Chester will rent at like a 30 percent discount. I think John's asking Mosquito. about tiny houses. Like no, I know he's asking. I know he's and asking, no, but now we have it. Yeah. But that would be good. You're talking about the ones with the Murphy bed, basically that you bought from. Even yeah. smaller houses, I'd be open to that. I mean, I guess you're able to build a tiny house. Take a shower. Tiny house, right? Maybe and cook dinner at the same time. The problem is the land cost is so high. Yeah. Yeah, you can build it. You have to have a square foot for a lot to build a 400 square foot house. Yeah. See, the micro units would get at the issue of affordability much more efficiently than a couple tiny homes. You know, if you did, if you allowed people to do even smaller units. But that's a different discussion. You can build one if you want, John. You just gotta you can go to the building department. I'm good. I'm thanks. Rented from you, John. <laughs> I'm good. There's no prohibition. Any other board members uh, have any questions that they would want to air tonight? We're going to talk about this again at the planning board meeting on 319. The commissioner said he will be here. Yeah. Uh, and I do like Lynn's idea of actually having our comments together probably sooner, so we can go through our questions actually yeah. sooner. So the next meeting we can yeah. just yeah, run that would be that. great. So we're going to forward them to Eileen. Yeah. And, and she'll, she'll compile them. I have one or two more yeah. I could ask. Yeah, would you, so, Can you just tell us again, who are you? My name is Anthony Fiorenza, born and raised in Glen Blood Plains, New York. I know, but what, are you here for what, a neighborhood or just as a person? Uh, for, for a neighborhood. I've actually got a list of about 36 households I'm representing. Okay. Uh, I've given speeches at the United Nations before during the General Assembly, and I've also done work uh, over in Asia, Eurasia, actually, uh, raising, raising money and also in the Southern Pacific. I have to say, everyone's nice here. I love everyone for being part of White Plains. This is by far one of the hardest places it's been for me to get a word in. Um, and I really just need like probably about 60 seconds of everybody's Ooh. time. And I really and I really respect everyone's time here. I want to be friends with everybody here. I think that we'd all like each other. I don't think the that reason you guys it's hard to be heard is we tend to follow the rules. But <laughs> the the members are not finished yet, so just please hold on. I just want to. I mean, if it's okay, um, the I get a lot of questions from people about the affordable housing assistant fund assistance yep. fund. Um, yep. Basically, I think the problem is transparency. Mm -hmm. So they always say, well, I know people are buying out of their requirements, mm -hmm. and where does the money go? What do they do with the money? Yeah. I get that all the time. Well, how do we know they're really I get using it? All the time it? too. Is there the something time. that's available for people, so, or can you explain? Yes, and, and we, I do answer. I mean, so transparency. We've got two million dollars in the fund right now. Um, how much? Foiled all the time. We've got two million now. We have much more approved in projects now. The thing about that fund is that obviously the payments are made only when the certificates of occupancy are issued for the construction of that building, right? The idea is okay. in 90% of those cases, the building has to be complete because obviously <laughs> the, the units would have been available upon completion. So it's not like we're getting front-loaded millions of dollars when the building starts. Right. So that takes years. Yeah. Um, so we have a $2 million and we have very clearly, um, you know, we had a million dollars in the last Brookfield phase that came before the Common Council. The Affordable Housing Assistance Fund, a half, is very clear in our regulations, right? What the money can be used for, um, acquisition of property, partnering with nonprofits, it has to be in furtherance of fair and affordable housing. The a half fund, which has gotten a lot of interest since 2019 when we updated the rental regulations for the city, which made it allowable, or you, you were able to, for the first time since 2019, buy out of a portion or all of your affordable housing requirement, depending on the scale. Uh, for rental units. We've had it on the books for ownership for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that A half, that Affordable Housing Assistance Fund, mm -hmm. has been established for years, you know, for 15, 20 years. And we've been using it in the past, very, you know, in front of the council. So we did 65 Lake Street, that's $400,000 for the Amy Zion Church, a million dollars for Brookfield. Um, there's been many projects even before I got here that have used A half funds. So we have about $2 million now. We're expecting more in the coming, you know, few months when these buildings get a little further along. Um, and I think we've approved, don't quote me exactly, I can get you the number for next meeting, 
probably another six or seven million dollars that if these buildings are completed, the city would have. I can say there's going to be some, you know, we've definitely got developers reaching out to us all the time to help subsidize the projects. And I can say in the coming months, I think I'm proud to say, and when it gets to the council and gets referred to you, there's definitely going to be one coming that perhaps will afford, uh, include both ownership and rental. And that's going to be partially made possible through the city. So in every case, it's not general fund money. We've gone to the common council. It's completely transparent. Um, but I can definitely get the list, like I've done for a lot of these folks at um, but the money is not going to the general fund. <laughs> we just don't have it all yet. Yeah, I just think people don't know. They're not aware. Of yeah. What's... Yeah. 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 Put it on the website. The it's on the website. You can see on the development what each oh, thing no. is. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. The transparency is great, and you mentioned the regulations on that one too, but is there any opportunities for us to use that fund for creating public housing on the city-owned lands, yeah. the, the substandard lots? And that's, that's, and that's one of the recommendations in here, is about using city-owned property to, you know, we know how challenging it is to fund affordable housing, so yes. Um, so I'll definitely get you that number, but it's been out there. I think there's a lot of people seeing we, we approve site plans and then it takes several years to build or even more. And so you see a $3 million payment and, and it's not coming for years. So the good news is we're getting some money is, in. Is there an application process to apply for to use those funds or is it through nonprofits? It, it's, it's, a it's, a great, initiative it's a great thing. It's, it's really, you know, kind of an as people reach out to the city. I mean, I think there's two ways of looking at it. The city clearly has desires, as you see in this document, to kind of formalize that process about whether it's acquisition of property or partnering with nonprofits. Um, there's not and this might be a great recommendation to put in there. There's not a formal application. You don't go to the website as a developer and say, I'm requesting. Obviously, the people that have requested that are developing will always come to the city and say, listen, we want to do this affordable. We have this investment from the county. This, you know. So it does happen that way, but it's not you know, on the website, download a form, and, and this is my project. So, But the council does have to approve it. That's clear. And I will also go a step further. The way we've done it is we approve a site plan, and then if there's any money coming from that fund to help fund that project, that's a whole separate action of the Common Council. So it's very clearly, this is what it's for, this is why it's needed, and this is what it's going to do. And the money that we're using has to, the units have to basically adhere to the current program regulations. So it's not like we're doing higher income, we're not giving money to subsidize units that wouldn't be even in our program and that sort of thing. So, but I will come with that because I think you're right. People are, are thinking it's, ask. no, I get it all the time. Yeah. yeah. General fund, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other members have questions? Thank you, but we'll save them. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, I am going to take a very short public comment, uh, not because I want to, but I did say last, last week that I would do it, so I'm going to do it. But I'm going to say it with the understanding that this is not going to be communicated to the council. And unless they're watching, they're not going to hear what you have to say. I appreciate it. You're a man of your word, Chairman Iorra. You said 60 seconds. If you guys can give me three minutes instead of 60 seconds, I would love you even more. We're all from the same neighborhood. The idea is that we all get heard and we all want to hear each other. Um, at the end of the day, I think this is a place for understanding and everyone should at least understand each other's different opinions, right? Um, going into this, I want to say thank you very much for your, for your kind words and you gave a great presentation. Uh, that being said, speaking of the presentation, one of the most um, appealing parts of that was the interactive map and also all the input that was put in through the city. I want to say thank you for trying to get all that input and garnish all the opinions to really make sure we have a comprehensive plan that represents our city. Unfortunately, in my neighborhood, I've gone door to door. And like I said, actually over 30 households, I've known about this for just over a week. And I do work from 8 to 7 o'clock. Um, and not one household had any idea that this was going on. Um, and I think that that's a problem. And I know I see some people sort of like looking like, yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know if it's increased mailers and, and maybe there needs, needs to be a new digital outreach program. But I'll, but I'll finish. Hold on. I have actually a, a little bit more to. I will, I, I'm not going not gonna to cut you off, but I will say this has been the most publicized initiative that White Plains has ever undertaken. Then that's, uh, uh, for, unfortunately, then that's very sad because... My neighborhood people don't know about it either. Thank you very much. That's a very honest statement. And I have to say, you asked some great, very great questions, and I appreciate all of your input because all these questions are useful. Ms. Vanilla asked very great questions. I think you all did. But they um, don't have any input into anything anyway. Well, they have their own, their kids going to school. So I'm just saying it's not right. the city's fault. Out of a, no, of course. Well, out of a, um, you said it was a 400-page plan, right? I don't know when the last time anyone here read a J.K. Rowling Harry Potter book, 
but 400 pages is really long. Um, and I want to know if anybody here who plans on putting in their opinion read all 400 pages verbatim, word for word. Because this is a plan that's going to be putting in, in force. And this, um, oh, it might not change zoning, but this is going to be the plan that recommends a baseline of what we do in the future for our city. But I um, have to tell you, they did an excellent job of having summaries. Where you Summaries then, are where, great. Where then you could read more detail. So I know because we, when I was with the county, we had been involved in a master plan. People don't want to read a lot, but right. you can read a few pages here and get a real sense of what's being recommended. So and I, and I of, want to get to the two point of, of the board, recommended. Two of the board members were were involved intimately in its creation. So yeah, we've read it. Okay, so recommended by who is also what I wanted to get to as a point. We have the interactive map. Um, the interactive map is great, but it's actually, I don't want to say antiquated, but it's not up to par. We don't have any guarantee that, the, that these opinions are even from people from White Plains. Right before I walked into this meeting, I posted a comment. It says something along the lines of, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak, Mr. Ioris. Um, this comment was posted while I was on a VPN out of Hong Kong. Okay, and I use the name Xi Jinping. And it is on our interactive map. You can go ahead and access that. The person named Xi Jinping went from a Hong Kong IP, meaning a computer pinged out of Hong Kong, added a comment to White Plains to suggest something. So I think that's also very alarming. I can't access a ton of my apps when I'm on my VPN because it knows that the location service doesn't match where I am. I can't go on ChatGBT. I can't go on certain Facebook uh, websites. This website should be secure. We should know that these opinions are coming from people that are actually in our community. Um, and actually, that's something that's really alarming to me someone that's a little bit younger, because I want to make sure that there's no outside influences trying to change the city. And I get it if there are outside influences, but the, the, the people that work in the city, the people that commute to the city, the people that live in the city, that's who we're all here working for. And listen, I, I, if anyone has known me from outside here, I'm not a biased person. I'd break my back for anyone. I'm the type of person to come shovel your driveway on the other side of town, regardless of who you are, where you come from. Um, I think and I should, should be okay, though, just a personal, I guess, uh, observation that, I mean, if not everybody even across the city knew about the plan or has taken so the time, and you've mentioned your work hours too, and same goes for it. I think a lot of people leave it in this room today. So I would doubt there would be, I would call them like antisocial, anti-white plains Most folks that would interested. actually want to comment. They're uh, just not interested. But I would also, interested. It's exactly. To do and with the city. I would also say that uh, the consultants that the city had hired were looking at every comment that was received, that was posted on the website, but I, or via email, and they've taken into consideration every single one. Thank you, uh, Chairman Ioris, is a great comment, but I don't think it's going to get included in this because it's not pertinent. But of there was a group not. that was it actually actively monitoring and taking into consideration every comment. Yeah, well, it, it shouldn't be. And the other point is it shouldn't be possible. Now, that comment could have been a lot more cryptic, and it could have seemed like someone that was from White Plains that li literally lives in Wa Rye and works in Yorktown. And I know that might seem like, you know, it's, it's not as important to you guys, but that's just one thing that I wanted to bring up. Uh, moreover, I wanted to get more towards the idea of that we need to have people uh, I've seen comments, and I'm sure these ones have been ratified. People should be spread all over the city, and sort of comments that imply that the South End has a, an elite uh, rule over That's the rest. That's a problem. Yes. yes I well, I mean, I've seen these as comments, but um, the idea that we could come as, together as a central board and, you know, somehow divulge the minutia of what causes people to live in a certain area um, I think it's almost uh, antithetical, really. It's very contradictory to say that we're going to come in and we're going to try and help people to be able to buy houses. And what we're going to do is we're going to create multifamily housing. Um, because, to be honest, what I said before is who is multifamily housing going to benefit? It might benefit some renters in the short term before the rent goes up. But who's really the person that's looking at the benefit here? It's the developer. It's the opportunist. Right? And then the opportunist also becomes the landowner. So you open up the door to have more opportunists, um, opportunists that are developers with no intention of improving your city other than to have a spreadsheet. Um, rather than having single family landowners who when you do have ownership, you want to invest in something that I own, you know, everything. You know, if I have a cracked phone screen, I'd rather not have a cracked phone screen because I'm responsible for it. I have to get this fixed I'm for it to work I'm going to ask properly. that you bring this to a point and to a conclusion. Because it sounds like a lot of what you're saying, you should have been involved in the 
15 or 20 I wish I would have known. And unfortunately, I think it's almost a crime that I didn't know. I think that it's, it's, it's very unfair. And I'll tell you, that's a feeling. So and you guys could judge my feelings however many, way you want, but I feel like well, I was treated unfairly. And the people I unf- represent unfairly? also. Unfairly? They, they weren't, we, we weren't given any representation. I think that encouraging uh, diversity right, stop, and addressing divides stop, within the community stop, are noble goals. Stop. Comments are over. Okay. If you're going to say that you were treated unfairly by the city of White Plains because you didn't notice any of the publicity for one White Plains is an outrageous comment. It's, it's not outrageous. It's an outrageous comment. This has been going on for three years. So I'm going to ask for a motion to close the meeting. I'm done. May I have a motion? I move. I need a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much.